when you have the knowledge that you can make it happen, but you still got to do the work. Welcome to Agency for Change, a podcast from Kid Glove that brings you the stories of change makers who are actively working to improve our communities. In every episode, we'll meet with people who are making a lasting impact in the places we call home. Can you imagine accepting a loan if you didn't know about interest rates or what about credit cards or if you weren't familiar with how they worked, grace periods, annual fees, would you sign up for one? For many in the United States, this isn't a hypothetical scenario at all, but a reality of their daily lives. Financial literacy, things like understanding the concepts behind saving, investing, or debt is something few people have. And according to research from the Milken Institute, just 57% of U.S. adults are considered financially literate. Another survey from CNBC found that while 83% of adults feel parents should be responsible for educating their children about finances, 31% say they never discuss the topic with their kids. As for public school education, just 17 states currently require a personal finance class to graduate. With few resources at school and less at home, where will today's students gain their financial education? For Colorado, at least, one organization is stepping up to fill that gap with valuable resources for teachers, parents, and programming for students and events for the community. Stay tuned as we discuss the benefits of a financially literate community, the kinds of resources the organization provides, and even how and when parents should talk to their kids about personal finance. Hey, everyone, this is Lynn Weinman, President and Chief Strategist at Kid Glove. Welcome to another episode of the Agency for Change podcast. Today's guest is Bill Tortorisi, Chief Philanthropy Officer at Economic Literacy Colorado, which prepares students to achieve a lifetime of economic understanding and financial security. Bill, welcome to the podcast. Lynn, it is great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I always look forward to talking with you, but I also really look forward to sharing about your work today with the listeners of the podcast. And just to get us started, how would you describe the work of Economic Literacy Colorado and how do you help people? Great question. So uh, let me just start by saying uh, Economic Literacy Colorado has been in the Colorado region for over 50 years. And That's originally- a long time. It That's is almost long- as old as I am. I, <laughs> I'm not even touching that. But <laughs> but what I, what I will say is that you know, we started off as an, a professional development organization for educators. And really what this organization is set up to do is setting up students with crucial life skills to understand economic and financial security. And we do this by equipping teachers with the tools and the knowledge to teach personal finance and economics in in their classrooms. And that's the long and the short of it. But what we really ultimately want to do, just as you alluded to, is, you know, ensuring that every Colorado student has the opportunity to learn how the economy works and how to make well-informed choices. At the end of the day, we're just using financial literacy as a vehicle to make good decision making, which is what we all want. Yeah, that that is really that is really good. And You know, when you really think about all of the things you might learn as a student or a young adult or even an older adult, financial literacy is one of those things that is really going to impact your happiness and stability and and everything about your life. Bill, I'm curious, how did you get in this line of work? Like, how did you develop this passion for financial literacy? Were you on the playground as an eight-year-old <laughs> going, when I grow up, I'm going to teach people about financial literacy? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've actually had this conversation a number of times. And every time I go, how did I, how did I get here? <laughs> so 
I, you know, I came out of college wanting to work in television production. That was that was oh. what I thought that I wanted to do. Um, it seemed rather glamorous, and yep. I, I worked on uh, behind behind the camera, and I like putting I like putting pieces together and, and telling stories. I actually started an internship at the, the NBC affiliate in Chicago, where my family is originally from, and I was like, I made it. And then, you know, <laughs> and then I I found out, yeah, it, this is not for me. It it really didn't interact with people, and I I missed that relationship building. Yeah. I, I what I didn't realize though was that is the direction I really wanted to be, and I want to be able to talk and interact with people, find out what their passions are. You know, in a roundabout way, I fell into fundraising. As I went through that process of learning about every spectrum, every every part of the discipline of fun, fundraising, I found myself in the cultural side. So I worked with Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. I moved with my family to Denver Zoo, and I loved it. It was great. Yeah. And as much as I love supporting animals and connecting people to the living world, it was really nice to support kids and people yeah. and things. Asian elephants are great. Beluga <laughs> whales are great. But what I want Humans even do, better. Humans are even better. <laughs> and I found myself working in the education space. That was uh, really eye-opening for me as I, you know, I had just had my kids and they were growing up. And I was thinking about, you know, what what are the things that I wish I would have known when I was young, younger, so I could have made better decisions. And I've I've been with this organization now, Economic Literacy Colorado, for a little over a year and a half. And man, here it is. This is yeah. the mission. This is the one that makes sense for me. And um, it was really spurred on. As a matter of fact, as, as COVID hit, I was working for Special Olympics Colorado, and they're an event-based organization. And uh, I was obviously, I was a fundraiser for them. And COVID hit, events stopped, and they they had to make some tough choices. Yeah. During that process, I was out of work for about five months, and I was thinking to myself, here I am. There is all sorts of turmoil in the world. I'm 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 out of work. However, I'm I'm okay. Yeah. And I thought to myself, how is it that I I'm doing okay? I'm in a financial position to make some decisions yeah. for myself. And there are so many people that don't have that option. And this opportunity with ELC came up and I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This, this makes sense to me. And how do I, how do I put my skill set in this, in this space to be able to make change and to be able to help people that don't have that kind of privilege to, to make better choices for themselves, whether it's for themselves personally, for their families. Or the communities that they live in, and that's that is I'm 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 all in on this. So wow, it's been it's been a really great journey, uh, personally and professionally, and it is it is so important. And and one of the reasons why it's so important is now that I know more about the education system, particularly in Colorado but around the nation, financial literacy is not a priority. And it it opens the door to so many possibilities, and uh, we're we're limited right now. To be frank, wow, wow, Bill. One of the things I love about doing this podcast is I get to learn so much about people. You and I are friends. We've talked about many things, but I didn't really know your story, and that's that's a really a really really awesome story. So I mean, you know firsthand about the power of financial literacy, but. You know, can we talk a bit about why should communities care? Like, why why should communities in Colorado care about financial literacy and the work that you're doing? Well, I think it comes down to one one word: it's choice. Yeah. If if you if you choose not to empower yourself with knowledge again using using financial literacy as a vehicle that's what we do but anytime you suppress the opportunity for knowledge mm -hmm. you limit your choices and and i think we've talked about this before is this is a generational issue financial literacy in, in general is is 
is is a is a challenge, but the the opportunity for choice is is really limited when you don't understand the Im- the impact and power of yeah. of knowing your own f- personal financial impact, and we're we're all subject to bad choices when we don't when we when we don't know. And I'll give you an, a great example. When I was in middle school, I had an opportunity to learn how to write a check in home. Oh, yeah. yeah. So great. I had no context for that. But what I did learn is this is the one place that you you know how to write cursive. Yes. Great. Yep. Um, you can put numbers to a piece of paper and it somehow translates into money. No context behind that. The second thing that I learned was how to get a free t-shirt on a college campus. <laughs> Now, if I if I knew enough, if I had more context, I would have known that that T-shirt, one, poor quality always, always. but two, can get me into a lot of trouble if I don't have the understanding of what it meant to have to build credit right. <laughs> or, to, or to build right. bad credit. You're so paying interest on 20 years for that pizza that, you ordered that's, for that's 18. Right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So again, you know, in retrospect, if I had the knowledge behind me, I would have made better choices as a younger person. Uh, only by the grace uh, it, do have I been able to come out on the other end. And that's really due to a lot of the privilege that I have as the person I am. Yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of communities that don't have any other choice. I made the choice to be able to look for another position that that suited my skill set yeah. during during the pandemic. There's a lot of people that don't have those choices. Right. They have to go for the first thing they can. To, that's right. To, yeah. That, that's right. So again, knowledge is power. It's the NBC uh, floating star across the the, the screen saying yeah. the more you know. The and, more you and know. That's, that's absolutely true. That that's that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Bill, in the intro to this podcast, I noted some statistics in that the majority of Americans believe that um, financial literacy should be taught by parents. But what if the parents don't have the knowledge? I mean, a high percentage of people do not have the knowledge. So then um, if you're not getting it from your parents and you're not getting it from your school, then where do you get it from? It doesn't seem like there's a lot of options. So I I understand that the state of Colorado does not require personal finance or economic education classes to graduate. Uh, this is probably a trick question, but if you were in charge, would you change that? <laughs> well, I mean, that's a slam dunk. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, here's here's what I'll I'll, I'll tell you is, one, we know that there is a generational challenge with financial literacy. So, you know, we talked about before we started this podcast, this lack of financial literacy is is perpetuated from generation to generation. And, it, and you know, a lot of circumstances was viewed as taboo to talk about your finances. Yeah. yeah. So, so number one, addressing, you know, if you're not getting it from your family, that's number one. Number two, you know, there's a lot of educators themselves that fall into the same category of having a lack of financial literacy. And then on top of that, not having a requirement to graduate, you know, in some form of economics or personal finance to graduate, that sort of perpetuates that. That's why organizations like Economic Literacy Colorado or Junior Achievement or um, we have another one uh, locally, Young Americans. These are institutions that are built around empowering and providing knowledge in the financial space. And, and there's an increasing urgency to have organizations like this help fill in the gaps. And until those roadblocks are removed and the state or states around the country decide, you know what, this is a priority, you know, we're going to the burden is going to fall on organizations like us to be able to do it. Yeah. So that that's really kind of where we're at right now. And speaking to, to Colorado, only about 25% of the school districts here in this state include personal finance in their approved graduation qualifications. So we have a lot of work to, to do in this state as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. So, so Bill, looking at things more specifically, can you talk to us about the resources or the programming? Like, what does it actually look like for Economic Literacy Colorado to deliver your work? Right. Well, so an in- interesting question in delivery. I, I would say before the pandemic, we were very much in person, hands on, providing workshops for our educators. And since then, we have, and this has been a blessing in disguise, we have a hybrid model um, so that we can do things virtually and we can yeah. do things in person. But what we really hope to do is deliver impact in a, in a unique unique way. And, and part of that is what we like to call the multiplier effect. So we leverage educators' ability to reach hundreds of students each year. Last year, we impacted about 80,000 students through wow, our-, that's, our through that's quite a lot. It's, it's, it's good. It's good. However, it, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. There's about 855,000 students enrolled in Colorado schools. Okay, so, that makes it sound less good. Yeah, there's, it, there's it does. For improvement. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, that- that is not an un. That is not a an ununique uh, right. number for either of the financial ed institutions that I just named. Right. Again, our backbone, our you know, our foundation is providing professional development for educators. But how we do that is we we offer classes, lesson plans, instructions. So that no matter what their discipline is, whether it's social studies, it's science, it's math, that they have the ability to be able to integrate it into their lesson plans. It really doesn't matter if it's K through 12. We we cover it all so that they have the ability to do that. And, and then, of course, all of that is just so that we can ensure every Colorado student understands how the economy works, whether it's managing their personal finances or just overall making good choices. Yeah, that's that's fascinating that you could go from a middle school teacher to a high school science teacher. There's there's ways to incorporate this learning in a variety of different curriculums. That's right. And and those are the indirect ways that we impact students. The direct ways are in the form of currently two programs. Um, One is the stock market experience. And then the other is invest in girls. Now, the stock market experience is really a virtual platform. Classes are able to form teams. They develop their own investment portfolios. They're given a virtual $100,000. And then they go through the process of investing in different companies and, you know, talking about uh, what their investment means, the fluctuations in the market, how yeah. it affects. So there's a lot of reach, research and analytics uh, in, in, their, in their process of doing that particular program. And then there's Invest in Girls. Now, Invest in Girls is a really unique program that we brought on. And as I say that, I will go back to stock market experience because Invest in Girls has inspired some changes to our ah. um, our programs. But okay. this program was actually developed, uh, Investing Girls was developed by our uh, national affiliate, uh, the Council of Economic Ed- Education. And it's really to create the first generation of financially literate girls and encourage them to pursue uh, careers in finance. And the reason why I say that is because there is certainly uh, inequities in the financial services industry, and there there's a disproportionate number of, of women in the financial services industry. So this is just an opportunity to kind of open that door for them. There are really three components to this program is educate, inspire, and connect. Nice. And so what we want to do is increase personal financial literacy schools of these young women. We know that, you know, financial literacy equals independence. Yeah. And, and, and what we also know in the next 10 years, well, two things, women bear the responsibility of financial decisions in the family. That's number one. Number two, in the next 10 years, we know the largest transfer of wealth will fall to women. So that makes this urgent. And of course, we want to make sure, as I said before, the deficit in the financial services industry, let's open up the doors. Let's be able to show women, 
see yourself in these spaces. It's really important for them to see their financial futures or their futures in general in these spaces. Yeah. And then, of course, what we want to do is be able to connect them, connect them with mentors, connect them with leaders that look like them. It's it's important for us, us to build a cohort of young women and alumni, we'll call them alumni um, yeah. in the workforce that can kind of show them the ropes and show them their experiences. That's Invest in Girls, and we're we're just thrilled to be able to, to have this, this program. But what we thought, going back to uh, stock market experience, is stock market experience has always been a virtual experience for, for our students. But why can't we continue to develop this program in a way that kind of echoes what Invest in Girls does? Let's get them out of their chairs away from the computer yeah. and in front of people in the workforce, people that work in the investment space. I love that idea. How do we connect them to business leaders? How do we get them in front of people that spur on conversations and curiosity? Those are the two programs that we are cultivating. You know, I think giving financial knowledge and information is important. How it applies to the real world is something completely different. As I as I look at this, and as our as an our as our organization looks like look looks at this, it's it's about how do we build that that pipeline from knowledge to applied knowledge. Yeah. So that when you're ready to make a decision about what your next step is in the education space, I want to go to a four year institution. I want to go into the workforce. You're ready. You understand, you know, options, choices. I love that. So Bill, as you're building, as you're, you're building this path, what roadblocks are there? Ro there must be roadblocks that get in the way. What, what are they? What are the things that you're kind of overcoming to deliver this information? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think the, some of the roadblocks are very, very obvi obvious. Uh, one of them is no state mandate. Now, yeah. I know that the mandate is a terrible, like people hate the people word. People do hate that word. <laughs> mandate. But, you know, I think that is one of the, <laughs> use the word requirement, there mandate, you go. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Change surely, the word. Wordsmithing. You know, In advertising, yeah, we call yeah. that wordsmithing. <laughs> right. But I mean, I, I think part of it is a lot of the schools uh, in this state, and, and it might be the same in, in around the country, is uh, a lot of the school boards are, are are locally controlled. They make decisions about what the curriculum is, what curriculum is most important to them. And it's tough. It's a tough burden. Just speaking from my experience as a parent in, in the school district that I'm in, you know, there's a lot of social, emotional funding that is taking place. There's more counselors in schools. Sometimes what is required by the state to fulfill as far as testing and learn, all of that is important. Yeah. Um, but I think it's about how we prioritize what's important too. The question right. is, is when our students leave school, what are the what are the skills that we want them to walk out with? That's the real question. Do we want them to be able to make the decision to go into the workforce? Do we want them to make the decision to go to higher learning? With that comes responsibility and and debt. Let's be real frank yes. about what kind yes. of decision making they are they are they are entering. As I said before, I I had an opportunity to work in the education system for a brief time. And I my eyes were very, very open to this. So I'll, I'll, I'll refer to, well, I'm not going to say specifics, but I, I worked for an organization that had charter schools around uh, the Denver metro area. I love the school. They had two things that were, that inspired me to no end. One was 100% yeah. graduation. Of course, this is great. That's, that's pretty cool. That's yeah, absolutely great. Now, and, and, and to back up, the audience that they're serving are typically low income, typically multilingual. English is a second language at home, so you're you're dealing with a, a student population that is somewhere north of seventy percent on the free and reduced lunch scale. So, yeah, you know, having that makes. 
hundred percent graduation. Totally, really absolutely. impressive. Now this is where it gets weird for me. The aspiration was hundred percent acceptance to a four year institution. Now that's great in in theory. However, when we're talking about low income, obviously we're talking about scholarships yeah. and applying and fast food and right. all that stuff. Now. Think about what that really means. Think about the decision points that that come into play on that. You are going to have to explain to your student, you know, what that decision means. Are they equipped? That's also getting the family in, involved. They may not have English as a, a as a primary language, right? Yeah, yeah. We are starting to make investments that will sit with them for the rest of their lives. You know, we just went through a process where we're getting college debt expunged, right? So what are what are we really asking them? And if we're asking them that question to aspire for more, are we, when they are in that institution of learning, providing them financial literacy so that they know what they're yeah. doing? Right. That, Something that you can't just click through on you a computer can't. screen where you actually have if to learn it, If you're right? a college prep high school, are you and do you have these components added to your cadre of curriculum? That's the real question. Yeah. Um, so those are roadblocks, and they're, they are made by individual schools, individual school districts. So that, again, those are roadblocks. Also opportunities, but yeah. we need to make sure that everybody... You know, it doesn't have rose colored glasses here. Right. Bill, my kids are all young adults now. And we had a conversation not too long ago about how easy it was for them to sign some papers, click a button, and spend a lot of money, whether it's a car, a, a home, free t shirt, a free t shirt. Did they loans, get a free t shirt? A free t shirt. <laughs> they, they, they're beyond the free t shirt age, but it's like, Wow, it's it's um, mind boggling that somebody just approved me to get a loan for a house or a car and and how surprisingly easy it was and how I could surprisingly get myself into a lot of trouble if That's I right. wasn't wasn't really, really thinking about it. So along the lines of kids, I'm curious, in your opinion or in in the information you have access to, when should parents start talking with their kids? about financial literacy and where should you start? Oh, that's such a great question. Well, I mean, the first part of that answer is now. You can do it. Now, yeah, okay. I mean, you can do it. You can do it at any time, right? There's there's easy concepts that you can teach your kids about, you know, yeah. um, you're just making good choices. Again, I, I use this as, you know, uh, we use financial literacy as as the vehicle. But, you know, again, it's about consequences for your actions, right? Like, you know, we talk about scarcity. If you have X and you have Y, what are you left with? You're always making choices. Whether you think it's revolving around finances or not, the idea that you can talk about what your wants and needs are, what's important. These are just general concepts that we talk about all the time, whether it's to our educators yeah. and their professional development or it's our, our direct student programs. Start now. It's easy to, to do. And I think it, it might be easier as a parent too, right? Like because yeah. you do that every every day, especially if you got young ones, right? You're always talking about consequences. Right, oh, right, right. Like, yes. Make good choices. You mentioned like this is all a matter of making all, good choices. Right? So they sign, we're talking if about they sign that. Documents yeah. for a new car or or a home loan. You know <laughs> what's the small print? Is it worth it to you? Yeah. Are you prepared? Are you in a position to fulfill that commitment? Yeah. I mean that's. I mean it's it's as basic as that. Right. Right. I love it. I love it. It's clear you're you're having a great impact in the community and we'll only have more and more. I'm I'm curious, 
I know you've been with the organization only for a year and a half, but are there any memories that stand out to you of how, you know, you've impacted somebody with this Yeah, work? absolutely. I've, I've been really fortunate. Things have kind of ramped up since we've kind of broken out of the, 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 the pandemic world, but we've had a couple of events and particularly re- revolving around investing girls. We had a symposium where we brought in about 25 uh, young women and we we had a day long session at um, one of our partner uh, business partners and it was it was really it was really cool and this young woman who actually attends an arts high school and i think she was just trying to get a feel for you know what it might be she yeah. had really no idea what she was getting involved in and so we go around this investment firm talk to people um she talks to a couple professionals that give her their experiences and their journey uh, which was super informative and she wrote back the next day going oh oh my gosh this this was so amazing and she was so articulate and so wonderful. We were like, you know what? We have this event coming up. We're going to have like 300, 300 of our closest friends. We're going to be fundraising off of this. Would you be willing to speak uh, speak about your experience? She's like, yeah, sure. Did oh, she do absolutely. it? Absolutely. So wow. she goes ahead and does this. And that that's not the best part. The best part is we have an amazing event. She speaks. Everyone's talking about her. And uh, about a month ago, she sent our program director a message and said, I'm looking for colleges. It would never have occurred to me that I, I, I would have done this, but every one of those, I, I'm an artist. I, I, this, is what, this is what I was meant to do, but every one of the, the schools that I have applied to have an econo- a great econ um, uh, track. And, wow. and, and I'm really interested in that. And I'm just so grateful that I was able to, to learn more about this, I'm excited for the future. And and again, it's not about like, oh, she's going to be in economics, whatever. Or she's going to be in the financial services. She's just excited that she's opened up the door for choice, right? Yeah, yeah. What I love about that too is because I employ a number of people who are in graphic design and art and have fine art degrees, The thing you always hear when kids go down that path is, oh, you don't want to be a poor, starving artist. Well, you don't have to be a poor, starving artist. You can be an artist or a graphic designer that understands your financial future and employs both sets of skills. Yeah, no, it's 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 really exciting when a light bulb goes off. I mean, you know, as a parent, when you see your kid or, you know, any any child. Oh, yeah. I get it. I get, I get it. it. Right. I mean, yeah. there's obviously a lot of projection in in all of that because I'm like, oh, I wish that would have happened to me. Like, I wish I would have been in a yeah. situation where I was like, ah, oh, of course, because you always look, look back and, you know, 2020 is always is always there. And you're like, oh, if I would have known what I know now. But when you can do that for someone, it's it's pretty powerful. That's amazing. So Bill, let's say, let's, let's, you know, turn the page a bit here. Let's say someone is listening here today. They have a strong financial background and they want to pass on that knowledge to others. How can they give back through Economic Literacy Colorado? Great, great question. Uh, First and foremost, because I am a fundraiser, you can give money. How great is that? You can give money. (laughs) You're good with money. You have money. All you got to do is write a check. Give the money. Excellent. (laughs) But but truthfully, you know, there's a bit of volunteerism and engagement, right? So, you know, what we do, and this is primarily with our, our student programs, is there's opportunities for mentorship. There's opportunities to get your business involved. And by that, I mean, we would love to do an industry experience, right? Like, how do we, our, yeah. our, our goal is how do we bring students to new and exciting environments so they can see themselves in those roles? That That is what I would encourage is this is a great way to participate. Pass on what you know, um, whether that's individually or get your team involved. Those are the kinds of things that we really want to expose our students to. Because again, yes, it's, you know, financial knowledge, having a great financial foundation is important, but also being able to apply in the real world and seeing how it works is equally important. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. You know, I'm going to ask you one marketing question. Being a marketing professional, I'm always curious. What is the biggest challenge for, uh, in terms of getting the word out about the organization and the work that you well, do? Well, I, I think, I think it's a, it's a crowded market, right? You know, I think that there's, yeah. um, everyone has their own homegrown curriculum, best applied practices, and there's a multitude of financial ed organizations. But to be fair, each one is unique in their own right. And and sometimes yeah. what you'll see is that there's no differentiation, right? The public doesn't see the difference between them, yes. right? So, you know, JA Junior Achievement brings workforce into the classroom. Totally awesome. It's great. Young Americans brings people to their facilities so that they can have a uh, a simulated workforce experience. E ELC does a multitude of things in educating educators and also having uh, direct student programs and bringing students to the workforce. So, you know, we all do something different, but it does get muddied. And and that that's the yeah. biggest challenge. So, you know, what we we have been trying to do much more thoughtfully is we just need to be present. We need to be at all yeah. of the things, you know, whatever event it looks like. We need to be there talking about our mission, talking about the differences and, and yeah. you know, not pitting each other, uh, pitting against each other, but just saying, hey, there is a just, just understanding. understanding. So, yeah, yeah, I wish there was a billboard that we could just put up. But I think a lot of it is just hoofing it and doing a lot of the the yeah. work um, and yeah. and being there. I appreciate what you said because we talk a lot in marketing. It's not about being the best. Like people don't really respond to chest pounding and we're the best. We're the best. But it's about differentiating and under have making sure people understand the mission and and where you meet them and what you deliver. So I appreciate you very quickly there gave us three organizations and their differentiating points. And, and I, I think that's fantastic. All right. I'm going to turn the page one more time, totally different question. And everybody who listens to the agency for change knows this <laughs> is my favorite question because I'm inspired by motivational quotes and I get to talk with so many inspiring people like yourself. Oh, you're being so generous. can you thank you. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Bill, can you give us a Bill Tortorisi original quote to inspire our Okay, listeners? I don't know if this is original. I, I'm I'm just gonna be really honest here, but uh, I this is something <laughs> I've carried with me since I was a little kid. So <clears throat> I was a really bad basketball player, um, but I would go to a bunch of basketball camps. And one of the tchotchkes that we were given when we when I went to this one particular camp was a pair of shorts. And on the back of the shorts, it said, if it is to be, it is up to me. Uh, now, I like now it. I have carried that with everything. And that doesn't mean like I'm the only person that can do it, you know. But what it does is it puts the responsibility in your hands. So you know, when you get knowledge, you know, we'll just use it, use it for economic literacy, Colorado. If you're an educator, if you're a student, if you are given the opportunity to get this knowledge, understand how it is applied, then you have the choice to be able to make it happen for yourself, whatever direction you want to go in. You can use this professionally. You can use this personally. At the end of the day, you're going to have to walk through the door that's open for you. And it's just been, yeah. it's something that has stuck with me. I, I use it at all times and it is empowering. And I think that's the, the biggest piece is it's empowering that when you have the knowledge that you can make it happen, but you still got to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just gave us a two for one. I think you gave us, if it is to be, it's up to me. But I think you also gave us, you have to walk through the door that's been open for you. I think that's a really, really good one too. So as usual, an overachiever uh, on your part. If I part. only did so, that as a young man. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You're still a young man. You're still a young man. So Bill, how can people find out more about Economic Literacy Colorado? 
Uh, how can they donate? How can they volunteer? I'm guessing you have a snazzy website that we can drive so people snazzy. to. www.econlitco.org <laughs> is the place where you can go. I would encourage anyone that would like to connect with me. I am a LinkedIn crazy person. I love chatting with people, whether it's about the work that I do or just in general. Uh, I love listening to everybody's journey. The more you know, right? Star goes across the, the screen. The more you know. Um, so yeah, you know, we, go go to go to the website. Always opportunities to give. Love that. Uh, if you want to talk to me, yep. I'll I'll still provide opportunities for you to give, um, but also to participate if you want. <laughs> Part, that's that's fantastic. Bill, we're going to make sure we have both of those links in the show notes on the Kid Glove website as well, in case anybody didn't get those. So what a fun conversation. As we wrap up our time together today, what is the most important thing you'd like our listeners to remember about the work that you're doing? It matters. I, it oh. matters. I mean, it matters not only for them, but it matters for every generation that comes after them. You know, again, I think the word of the day is choice. And 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 yeah. I think once you open open those doors again to, to possibilities and knowledge, um, that you are better informed and you can make better choices for you and the people around you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Bill. I fully believe the world needs more people like you and more organizations like Economic Literacy Colorado. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. Thanks so much, Lynn. We hope you enjoyed today's Agency for Change podcast. To hear all our interviews with those who are making a positive change in our communities or to nominate a changemaker you'd love to hear from, visit kidglove.com at K-I-D-G-L-O-V.com to get in touch. As always, if you like what you've heard today, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.